Cohabitation may be the most controversial subject in all of reptile keeping. So today, I want to go over how do you cohabitate reptiles? Can you do it at all? What are the best ways? And what are the top five reptiles that you can cohabitate? My name's Adam. This is Sarah. You're watching Wicked's Wicked Reptiles. Stick around. <laughs> All right, first things first, I wanna say that if you are an anti-cohab person, this one might not be for you. There are definitely ways you can cohab reptiles. I firmly believe that, not all of them, and there's actually much fewer circumstances where it's okay or doable than there is not. So I'm gonna talk about five species that can cohabitate with each other, and then I'm gonna talk about in each five if they can cohabitate with other species as well. If you want me to do a full video on can you know this species and this species go together in the same enclosure, put it in the comment section, we can do that another day. But let's just start off with number five, morning geckos. Now, this might be the most requested animal for me to talk about, which is kind of interesting because I never really thought they were super interesting. And then I got all these comments, hey, talk about morning geckos, talk about morning geckos. They're actually really interesting. And I knew about the parthenogenesis. So basically these are all females. Yes, the entire species is all females. They parthenogenesis basically means that they don't need a male to breed and all the, the females make females that are clones of themselves, basically. But they do have some, okay, you don't care about this species, what can they cohabitate with? Well, they can cohabitate with each other, which is really cool. So they can have these colonies, but if you do keep several of them together, you, you're gonna have babies. It's, it's gonna happen, there's really no way that I know of uh, to not have babies if you keep morning geckos together. But not only that, morning geckos can be with other animals as well. In fact, a lot of the times morning geckos are cohabitated with another one that you guys really love and want me to talk about, dart frogs. I love dart frogs. I literally have a dart frog tattoo on the inside of my arm. I think they're awesome. And with dart frogs, because they're going to be on the ground, active during the day, and morning geckos, although they can be active the entire, you know, 24 hours of a day, they're most active at night. They're not going to really bother each other. Morning geckos are going to be up in the trees or up in the canopy or wherever you give them above the floor. And the dart frogs are going to be on the ground. They're terrestrial. So it's kind of a, the perfect balance. And you don't have to worry about predation with either one. Your dart frogs are going to eat things like fruit flies, you know, stuff like that. They're going to eat small insects, uh, where with your morning geckos, they'll eat small insects also, but they'll also eat things like nectar, things like that. This is not a care guide, by the way. I can do one if you want, but not this video. And the cool thing too is morning geckos are small. They only get up to about four inches and, and dart frogs are really small as well. So you don't need a huge enclosure, but here's rule number one. I'm not going to put graphics up, but we'll talk about through the entire list, the do's and don'ts. And there's kind of some steadfast rules. Number one, no matter what it is, give them enough space. So whatever it is that you have, make sure you look, how much space do I need for one? How much space do I need for several of them? Don't put, you know, 14 morning geckos and 27 frogs in a 10 gallon enclosure. Like, don't do that. Make sure whatever it is, bare minimum, give them a little bit more space. Uh, I think we can move on. Number four, turtles and tortoises. Now you guys know that I've got two turtles, Buggy and Mappy. I love these guys. They're literally right there. You can probably hear their pump, which I forgot to turn off. And this is one that I cohab myself. I have a Mississippi Map Turtle and I have a Yellow Belly Slider. And some people would say that you don't want to cohab a big size difference like that, which I guess will be number two on the steadfast always rule. If something is much larger than the other, it's generally a good rule. And actually this isn't a steadfast always, but it's a good rule in general to never cohabitate things that are a big size disparity, right? For example, I'm not gonna talk about axolotls in this instance because they're amphibians and they're not reptiles and this is reptile list. But with axolotls, I've got several of those as well. And we are very careful to always make sure that if we cohab axolotls, which you can do very safely, they're the same size. Because if they're too small, they might, you know, get over outcompeted for food. Is that a word? Outcompeted? They're not going to get the food. The bigger axolotls are, are going to beat them to it. And also they can bully each other. With turtles, it depends on the species. And this is a big, broad range. Turtles and tortoises, like there's how many species that you could possibly keep in captivity, right? So in general, make sure they have a big enough enclosure so that both of them have their own space. And this is something that I'm working on. Uh, I have a plan in the works for a much larger enclosure for these turtles, which is gonna be really cool. And with turtles, you have that added dimension of water. Where did this gecko go? 
So you need a little bit of land area so both turtles can be on the land and be completely dry at the same time if they so choose, so they're not fighting over it, and also enough water as well. And then you wanna make sure that, that they're both eating. And that's the other thing too, rule number three. We're going through these rules of cohabitation pretty quick, faster than the animals. Always make sure that they're both eating. So, or several of them, right? So if you get a bunch of animals in the enclosure, it actually takes a little bit more work in terms of observation because you need, you need to observe them to make sure that none of them are getting sick, to make sure that uh, they're all eating properly, to make sure they're not bullying each other. So always observe. Like that's rule number one, probably, uh, honestly. That is the most important thing is to observe and make sure everything's going well. And then of course, if you find things like runny poops or it looks like something regurgitated, you're gonna have to separate all of them to figure out which animal it is because otherwise, how would you know which one to treat or to keep an eye on? Because if there's a bunch of them, you don't know which one the runny poop came from, right? So it's a little bit more work. Back to turtles and tortoises though. And with tortoises, tortoises are, they're pretty big. I mean, even small ones, right? There are small ones, but even if, uh, you know, a smaller sized one like, a red foot tortoise. You can have a bunch of those together. That's a very common practice, in fact. And actually with red foot tortoises or several other tortoises, you can keep them with things like green iguanas, which will spend time in the trees. Or some people even keep them with Cuban rock iguanas or rhino iguanas. This is something that you'd need a really big space for because both of those species of animal need a really big enclosure. So you can put them with other animals. Do your research. I'll say this like a hundred times. Do your research first. Don't just take this. Some guy on the internet was wearing a really cool shirt and had a gecko on his shoulder. He knows what he's talking about. I don't. I've never had a red foot tortoise or an iguana. I just know people who know a lot more than me who do that. And turtles, some of them can cohab with fish, obviously. Now, of course, depending on the type of turtle, some of the turtles will eat the fish, but in general, they live with fish in the wild. And a lot of people have ponds with their turtles and their fish. So they can cohabitate with fish or crabs or shrimp or things like that sometimes and of course this is species dependent so if I say tortoises can live together I mean redfoots generally you're not gonna have a lot of violence right but if you have a sulcata sometimes sulcatas beat each other up so it is totally dependent on the species number three anoles green anoles specifically although several others as well right but we'll talk about the species independently so i can give you better accurate information and i want to say thank you to the jersey herper for providing this really awesome footage thank you very much green anoles are kind of found everywhere if you're from the southeast if you're from florida for example uh anoles to you aren't pets they're pests or they're what keep your basement or your attic or your house clean no bugs because that's what they do they infiltrate people's houses and they eat bugs which is kind of cool here in canada we, we don't have anoles or really anything like that so to me that's super cool if you want to keep these guys they're not really handleable they're pretty flighty just like morning geckos by the way you wouldn't where's this gecko you wouldn't really want to handle uh morning geckos or anoles with anoles though they can actually cohabitate uh quite a bit as long as you have enough space again big space the more animals you have in an enclosure the more space you're going to need and make sure all of them have hides and water and okay all right anoles can also cohabitate with other species as well one note before i do that though if you cohabitate them together make sure that males aren't together in general some people do this and give them enough space and it's okay but males can fight so the safest way is one male and a bunch of females are just a bunch of females if you have a male and females obviously you're they're gonna breed so that's another thing you have to think about anytime you keep a male and females together there's that possibility that they may produce more of whatever it is. I think anoles are probably the most commonly kept with other species a lot of the time, besides fish maybe, which aren't reptiles, so that was stupid. And reptiles, they're probably the most commonly kept with other species. You can keep them with frogs. Tree frogs is pretty common, American green tree frogs a lot of the time, or other species as well. Uh, you can also keep them with grass tail lizards. Grass lizards. Long tail lizards and grass lizards. You can keep them with other species that are very similar uh, and also the similar size. So again, do your research first, but this is a very commonly kept animal in a community reptile tank. And that's a discussion by itself. Again, throw it in the comment section. We can go over community tanks if you want. I think anoles are awesome. When I was a kid, that was like the number one thing you'd see in pet stores all the time. They're really cheap, 10, 15 bucks, whatever. So it's one of those things where you could have a bunch of them in enclosure. It's a, not a huge enclosure and the food isn't super expensive and it really wouldn't cost you that much to have a really cool setup with like live plants and bioactive. Of course, they're fast, they're fun to watch. Uh, they go crazy over insects when you feed them. I love these guys. I think they're absolutely awesome and the males have that cool little dewlap. So yeah, anoles are, are freaking awesome. Number two, leopard geckos. 
And that's why I brought Sarah out for this video. On the channel, um, Littlefoot is kind of my companion running around my shoulder all the time. She's even got her own line of merch if you want to buy it on the store, I'd appreciate it. So uh, with her, uh, she lives with Littlefoot. And I know, a lot of you are going to be up. This is the time when the keyboard warriors start to type their angry messages. Mom, I'm going to be late for dinner and crack open the monster and just go to town. Leopard Gecko should never be housed together and sand will kill them as evil. Like, okay, I get it. I understand. Leopard Gecko cohabitation gets a bad rap from people who still use 1980s care information. <laughs> so I just want to set the record straight. There are wrong ways to do cohabitation with leopard geckos. And it is a little bit riskier if you don't know what you're doing than say turtles or axolotls or whatever. The reason is that you really got to get the size down and make sure that you observe because for some reason, some female leopard geckos just don't like other leopard geckos at all. They don't like male leopard geckos and will not breed. They don't like female leopard geckos and will not get along with them. You're going to find out pretty quick. Now, if you are going to cohabitate leopard geckos, the easiest way is right out of the egg. If you put a clutch mate together, two clutch mates together, supposing you incubated them both to be female and check that they're both female, they're probably going to be okay. I mean, Sarah and Littlefoot literally came out of the egg the same day, this far apart from each other in the same incubation tub. So they've never spent any time alone at all. So they're perfectly fine. They grew up the same. They fed perfectly together. I observed the crap out of them. Everything was perfect. If you take a leopard gecko that you bought from a breeder and then take another one that you bought from a different breeder and you stick them together, they're different ages. Maybe they're a little bit different sizes. Uh, they've lived their entire lives alone. Then it might not be so successful. It depends. It's up to you. You are the one who has to do the work to make sure that these animals get along. Basically do your observation, but once you do that and you make sure that everyone has a place to hide, uh, they have their own heat spot, right? Or the heat spot is big enough for two of them uh, and they've got their own water and their own food dish, then you're good. I, I really think that cohabitating leopard geckos can be very, very successful. With that said, never cohabitate males, ever. If you put two males together and then you go to sleep, when you wake up, you'll be getting one off the side of the tank with a garden hose. It does not, you'll have a dead leopard gecko, some assembly required, they'll be in pieces. Never ever do that. And in my opinion, never ever cohabitate full-time a male and a female. When males breed, it's not crazy violent, but I mean, he bites on the back of her head and the back of her neck and goes to town. Uh, it could really stress the female out if her entire life, she's just avoiding another male. So don't do that. If you're gonna cohabitate, only females under certain circumstances is my guide, my rule for myself. So do your research and decide for you if you want to go habitate leopard geckos or not. Oh yeah, and leopard gecko care guide up here. All right, let's move on. And number one, most cohabitable reptile, garter snakes. And again, thanks to the Jersey Herper for the footage. Again, killing it with the B-roll, man. I really appreciate it. Check out his channel. Garter snakes are something, again, that are really popular. I don't have any, uh, some species are illegal where I live because you find them in the wild. Like if I go find a snake in the wild, nine times out of 10, it's a garter snake. They're very common and there's a couple different species around here. And all over North America, there's species of garter snake that you can find. Uh, and actually Canada, something that a lot of reptile people know this entire country for is this one small little park, well not small, but one park uh, that's known for garter snakes, literally thousands, tens of thousands of them sometimes. Uh, they come out in these breeding balls or these hibernaculums in the springtime. Very, very cool. Um, but in captivity, they just, they do really well. Now, of course, they can be a little bit skittish, some species. Now this is pretty broad. There's lots of different species, right? You've got, you know, common garter snakes, red-sided garter snakes. There's a bunch of different species. So do your research before you go have any of them. But a lot of the times different species of garter snakes can be cohabbed together. Uh, garter snakes aren't really known in most part for being snake eaters. So you should be all right, uh, you know, and as long as you do with the same sort of thing, same sort of size. But what's really cool with garter snakes too is they give live birth. So if you keep a male with a bunch of females, one day if you don't really keep an eye out and you don't know what to look for for a gravid female, you might just come down and holy cow, there's a bunch of babies in there, you know? So garter snakes to me, for so many reasons, are so cool. It's just the way that they eat. They don't really constrict their, their prey and they're not truly venomous. So that's always interesting to me. The way that they interact with each other, they'll actually start basking in the sun. They are a diurnal species. Um, not too many reptiles just kind of bask like this, or not too many snakes, I should say. Hognose snakes do. But in the most part, I don't know if there's any species that's 
out as often and as frequent as garter snakes. And garter snakes is kind of what everyone around here kept when they were kids. Like you'd have them in a bin in your garage or you know, you'd sneak them under your bed as a kid, right? In a little bin. So garter snakes are something that most people in North America at least grow up with or they've seen. And it might be the first snake you've ever touched or caught or kept. So there's a special place in my heart for garter snakes. It's what I saw growing up, going through the woods and stuff. Um, but to keep them, it's just, they're not super duper popular. They're gaining popularity, but in captivity, I don't know, they're like, Chuck Wallas, which we talked about last week in this video here. They're cool and you can find them, field collect them, but they're not super popular. And I think that's gonna change. A lot of people ask for them. Uh, they do this really weird thing where they'll musk on you sometimes. So, I mean, once you get them uh, acclimated uh, to handling, then they're really good. But in general, they're not, you know, one to really lash out and bite at you, which is kind of why I put them at the top of the list. Not only do they cohabitate really well, but they're really great pets and they're good for all skill levels because they're not that difficult to care for. And also, if you're one of the people who doesn't like to feed rodents, they can actually live on fish and worms and things like that. Again, not a care guide, do your research. So there you go. Those are your top five and different ways that you can cohabitate reptiles. Is there something I should have added? And of course, what do you think for next week? I took this idea to the comment section below. I put it on a poll last week and that's what you guys voted on. Um, so next week, maybe we'll do your video, put it in the comment section. And as always, I wanna say a special thank you to the Patreon supporters. It's because of you guys that it's a little bit less stressful for me to put in rodent orders. Um, and there's awesome Patreons who, and everybody who's part of the Discord channel as well, everyone who's been part of the Discord, thank you guys so much. I get a lot of the extra B-roll so I don't have to go and find these animals. And you guys send it to me, you guys are like really participating in the channel and, and you make the job of making these videos a little bit easier. So, and you can join that for free. If you want extra vlogs and to know about animals and see these videos a couple days early, hit the Patreon link right here. Uh, did I plug everything? Hit subscribe. See you on Thursday.